Hey everybody, can you hear me? Get started here in a minute. Hello. Well, like I said, we'll start in a minute as we uh, get this ball rolling. My name is uh, Coin Week editor Charles Morgan, and this is our second midnight stream. Hello from Tucson, Richard Physician. I used to actually be stationed in Fort Huachuca, just down the road from you, so well familiar with Tucson and many, many trips to Bookman's and uh, uh, greetings from Hong Kong, friends uh, from all over the world. Um, like I said, my name is uh, Charles Morgan. I'm the editor of Coin Week. Uh, today, I decided to prepare a few things to show you. And if we have some time, if it's not too late, we'll, uh, I'll try to answer some questions. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about the uh, market for peace dollars. Of course, uh, peace dollars are... Uh, the series of silver dollars that replaced the Morgan dollar in 1921. Uh, here, if you haven't seen one, is a is a picture of a peace dollar. Let's see if I can show it to you here. Um, let me see. All uh, right, <laughs> still learning the way to do this, folks. Uh, so here we have is a, a peace dollar, uh, and the interesting thing about peace dollars is that uh, they were a design that originated from an idea that came about uh, to celebrate the peace at the end of World War One, and uh, the American Numismatic Association at the time was a fairly small uh, organization of coin collectors. And they took a, a very significant interest in promoting the idea of uh, uh, creating this uh, new dollar coin to replace the old one. Uh, of course, you know, many Morgan dollars, nearly half of the mintage that was struck was uh, sold to Britain and melted and became Indian rupees. Uh, as part of an asymmetric uh, campaign that the Germans uh, waged against uh, the, uh, the crown's economy. So uh, fearing a shortage of silver uh, could uh, significantly hurt their colonial interests in India. Uh, they bought a significant portion of silver and coined them into rupees. Uh, of course, the act that authorized this also called for the federal government to replenish its uh, stockpile of silver dollars. And so this is why you see the resumption of coinage in 1921. Uh, with uh, the Morgan dollar and then uh, being replaced near the end of the year with the peace dollar. Uh, the peace dollar has always played uh, a second fiddle, I think, to the, uh, to the Morgan dollar. And uh, one of the reasons uh, for this has been, uh, you know, the fact that the Morgan dollar stretches into the 19th and the early 20th century. It uh, has a connect, uh, direct appeal to the uh, closing of the Old West. Uh, there's also, you know, the Comstock load. The, it's sort of the silver version of the California gold rush. And uh, so I think that there's a lot, uh, it's a sexier coin and more allure, even though uh, the peace dollar has a fine design. In fact, uh, uh, despite what you may feel about it now, it was uh, one of these uh, very controversial designs at the time it came out. Um, again, uh, the American Numismatic Association uh, lambasted the design in their, uh, in their magazine and the numismatist. And uh, since the ANA uh, uh, has provided the complete archives of the numismatist uh, online in digital form, if you're a member, you can go check it out and go back to the 1921-1922 uh, issues and you can see uh, quite a bit of a, of a copy um, dedicated to trashing the design of the coin. So when we're talking about the coin, uh, we need to uh, look at the pricing um, and uh, talk about whether or not this is a series uh, you'd want to get into. Um, I pulled 
a, a significant amount of auction data and um, would like to show you uh, what uh, what I uh, understand as the uh, current situation of the market for these coins and uh, let's look at this here um, as you can see uh, let me take a second uh, the series stretches from 1921 to 1935 you have the 21, 22, uh, and D and S, 23 D and S, 24, and 24 S, 25, 25 S, 26, uh, 26 D and S, 27, 27 D and S, 28, 28 S. Then it skips a few years, um, resumes uh, production in 1934, uh, where it was also made in Denver and San Francisco, and then in 35 and then it was made in San Francisco. And uh, what I've done here is I've compiled uh, some uh, pricing for 63 to 67. Uh, now, this pricing is based on our own metrics. Uh, we use a, sort of a statistical uh, tool called interquartile range where we look at the, uh, the middle numbers that are represented at auction, throwing out the top and the bottom. We also uh, discriminate uh, about uh, the types of coins that we put in our data set, you know, uh, massive toners, uh, super nice CAC coins, uh, and the ugliest uh, imaginable coins for the grade. Uh, we, uh, we drop those from our pool so that what we're looking at is what I would call a typical coin for the grade. And uh, so when you see uh, the series, uh, a few things should jump out at you. Um, the paradigm of type coins versus semi-key coins versus key coins uh, has been altered dramatically with the acceptance of third-party grading. Uh, you would take a coin that would traditionally be very valuable uh, and, uh, and you would see that once you get to the high grades, uh, that the coin falls behind other coins, which would be seemingly less scarce. A perfect example of this is the uh, 1925S. As you see in MS63, it's about a $200 coin in today's market, but the 24S is more expensive. The uh, 28S is more expensive. Uh, and uh, even the 1934S, which I consider the key to the series, uh, is more expensive. But when you look at gem uh, quality coins, uh, you will see that the 25S simply does not come nice. And therefore, you see a massive jump in price from about $500 for 64, which is fairly plentiful, uh, to $24,000 or about the cost of a small car uh, for one grade up. So let's think about how one would construct a set of uncirculated peace dollars, what the commitment would be, and sort of what the best strategies would be to go about collecting this type. I put together some numbers at the bottom, and you'll see that uh, you can't necessarily uh, cost out each uh, this, the coin in each grade simply by tabulating the cost for uh, one of each coin in, in the grade. Uh, or if you did that, you would see that it would cost you roughly $9,330 for a complete set in MS63. Of course, your 34S is going to make up almost half of that, uh, or $15,179 in 64, um, $79,240 in 65. Uh, then you get $227,350 in 66, but of course there is no 25S in 66 that's really going to be available to you. And so you would have to dip down to 65. And then of course in 67, I, I didn't even bother to tabulate it because some dates it's just not, it's not even worth uh, considering. These are, you know, the snowflakes among snowflake coins and, and you won't see very many on the market. And if you are looking for them on the market, you're likely to not be so concerned about the price of the series. If I was going to put together a set or if I was going to advise a collector who seriously wanted to put together a peace dollar set, I would say the first thing you want to do is uh, consider the key dates as your first purchase. Uh, the reason I say this is because I think that is going to be the coin that dictates what the quality of your collection is going to be. If you are somebody who prefers quality over cost, um, 
you're going to have to understand that uh, quality 1934 SPs dollars are going to cost more than what we say they uh, run on average in the market. And the reason is that average coins bring average money and great coins bring higher dollars. Also, I would say if you look at the spread between 63 and 65, understanding the fact is that you're more likely to pay a premium for these grades than you would for the 66 based on quality. Uh, and the reason for this is there are fewer people who can play at 66 than could play at 63 to 65, even though 4250 to $7,000 is a pretty significant spread. I would argue that any high quality coin in this, in this field, uh, 64, 65, is probably going to run you between $6,500 and maybe even upwards to 9,000 and more if these coins are attractively toned. So I would say that your first thing would be to consider what you're going to do on that coin, even if it means, uh, making that purchase and spending a few months to uh, build up the, uh, the funds to do it or to look around. I think you do that. You take your time, you, th you approach and attack the 34S. And then after you get that coin, everything else sort of takes care of itself. I would not recommend the, uh, a collector who is not attempting to put together a world-class uh, top of the line, one, top two or three sets to even contemplate buying a 66 34s or even a 65 25s or 28s and these two coins the 25s and 28s your probably best bet is to find a cac approved uh high end high eye appeal example and 64 as 64 plus uh, the reason for this is because you're going to get a lot less exposure in case uh, more coins are made in the 65 grade by owning a 64, 64 uh, plus. And also because the, the spread just doesn't seem to be worth it for me. Um, I think it's not, an, it's not uncalled for to expect a super high quality 28S to set you back two, three, four thousand dollars $4,000 instead of the 900 we have there. And it's not unreasonable to expect a similar uh, thing for a very high in 25S. Now, you have to understand as a buyer that going into coins like this, that professional dealers and graders uh, will have looked at this coin and tried to submit it over and over and over again. Because of this, I don't advise you buying these coins with the expectation that they will upgrade because you like them. It's quite possible that they have maxed out their potential but because the spread between 64 and 65 is so dramatic, you should rest assured that as long as the coin is as nice as it could be for the grade and you're satisfied with the grade, then you got a good deal. After these coins are purchased, I think the rest of the series sort of falls in line. I don't think that uh, somebody who has a seven or eight or $10,000 34S is gonna be satisfied. Uh, with a $36.63 or a $48.64 for one of the common dates. I think in these scenarios, you're probably going to go for the best quality coins you can to augment your collection. You're going to look for coins probably in the 66 range. You're going to look for things with a superior eye appeal, maybe some color, depending on your, your uh, particular collector taste. And so the idea that someone would have a, you know, a max set when you consider that uh, so many exceptional coins are available on higher grades for cheaper money than you pay for the keys, it, it doesn't really make sense for something like a Peace Dollar series. I think you go for the most Jimmy coins you can find uh, and, you, and you just stick to that game plan. Once you knock out the keys, everything else is pretty straightforward and easy. Of course, you know, there are a few coins that are five, six, seven thousand dollars and, and 65. So you might be looking for four pluses in those instances, but the bottom line is the peace dollar market uh, is uh, viable. Uh, there's a lot of variety here uh, and it's a relatively short series. Uh, so for an investment of between, you know, 10,000 and on the, on the low end for a 63 set. And uh, I would say 25 to 30,000 for uh, a near gym set. 
uh, I think this is a, a series you can put together uh, with uh, without much trouble. Um, of course, uh, your best bet is to uh, reach out to a professional dealer, somebody who specializes in the series. They will have seen many, many more coins than you'll have a chance to see. And uh, once you show them that you are serious, uh, again, going for that 34S to start, that 28S, that 25S, you show them you're serious, serious there, then I think the higher end coins for the more common dates kind of uh, open themselves up to you. The dealer will take your enthusiasm and interest in the series seriously. And I think most dealers who specialize in a series want to see great collections built because it's good for their uh, niche of the industry. And it's, uh, and it's good for, uh, you know, their, their ability to uh, source those coins when it's time to uh, bring them back in. Now let's look at uh, some grades here. So uh, the first coin I want to show here uh, is um, a 1927. And uh, when we look at this coin, uh, we see that it's, uh, it's brilliant. Uh, it's got some discoloration, as you can see on the reverse. And you will see that this is a coin that is fairly typical for uh, a piece dollar that's uh, you know from a bag been in, been uh, moved around abused a little bit uh, there's scuffs all over the face and the fields it looks like there's you know a little effort to I don't know if that's uh, just some frosting that's uh, come in contact with the coin or if it's uh, you know an attempt to sort of uh, smooth out the uh, some imperfections but one way or another, uh, a major grading service looked at this coin and graded it MS-63. So at MS-63, we are uh, basically on a, uh, looking at a coin that would uh, be what you would expect on the low end uh, of a... Uh, of a coin that is a type coin and not, not a type coin it's sort of a, it's a little bit rarer than a type coin this is about a 150 to 175 dollar coin but if you were going to spend again if this was not a 27 but a 34s and you had the option of buying this coin at about four thousand two hundred fifty dollars or you could get a coin like this now this is a 26, but this isn't a 65. I think you would have to really strongly consider whether or not the three, four thousand dollar cost to upgrade the coin uh, isn't re isn't unreasonable when you consider one coin is uh, very, uh, very, um, very much. Uh, damaged really by its contact with other coins and the other coin is uh, for the most part mark free uh, in most of the major areas and so I think when you look at it this is what we're looking at when we're looking at the price spread of these key date coins if you're going to invest a ton of money in a coin it better have eye appeal because if it doesn't, then when you go to sell it, your coins are going to be bought at a discount. You're not going to pay a discount necessarily when you buy it, but the person buying it from you to resell it is going to command a discount. Now, I want you to see this coin right here um, because I think you'll be amazed at the difference between that 65 and this one, which is a MS-66 CAC. Now, CAC just puts a sticker on the coin after looking at it and reviewing it. They didn't originally grade it. Now, that 66 was applied to it by a major grading service. Now, the grading service got the coin pretty much right, as far as I'm concerned. This coin has superior eye appeal. You know, the fields on the face and the eagle are mostly clean. There's a little scuffiness here. You can see on the on one of the rays above the eagle's uh, wing, there's a scratch, right? But 
uh, the reverse of the coin is less important, I think, for most collectors than the obverse. Like Miss Liberty in this coin looks well struck, uh, not, not cut up, dinged, hit. And uh, so this is what I would consider a true gem. And if you had this coin in your collection, it would be amazing. And if this was a key date, you know that uh, it's going to be way easier to sell it uh, than if you have a coin that is less attractive. And I want to show you this coin because this coin really, um, this coin really shows you what happens when you have a a coin that is technically high end but doesn't have eye appeal, uh, what your in uh, what your immediate reaction to it would be uh, is uh, going to be dramatic. So let's look at this coin here. This coin sold for over a hundred and thirty thousand dollars at auction uh, recently, and it's graded MS sixty seven. And if you look, Miss Liberty's eye has like a discoloration uh, right above it. There's a tarnish on the reverse of the coin, even though it's, again, relatively mark free. Uh, this is a coin that needs to be conserved, I think, in order to get any amount of eye appeal. And so it is just absolutely essential that when you're buying these coins in the marketplace, that you are looking at eye appeal more than you are looking at the grade because you can find coins in uh in the in the grade without much of a problem uh technically the coins could be graded absolutely correctly but getting coins that just pop stand out make you say wow that's a nice coin i mean those those are unusual and uh, so anytime you can get them uh, i think that those are the coins you go for so here you go uh, this is a CAC 66, and again, here is your non-CAC 67, probably correctly graded. Um, it brought five figures at a public auction. Uh, you, I guarantee you this coin was handled and looked at by serious buyers, okay? It came from a serious collection, and my guess is that this coin is not going to be resold in this shape it's going to be preserved and uh, hopefully uh, some of these uh, this discoloration although it's probably original uh, can be removed so this coin can look as it did when it was struck and this this coin in 1921 when it was struck was probably just unbelievable okay uh so that kind of uh, encapsulates how i feel about the peace dollar market um, I was looking at some auction uh, prices uh, for um, U.S. coins uh, at the pre-Long Beach show at Goldberg's, uh, and uh, I found a lot of uh, a lot of uh, positive signs. Um, uh, the uh, early copper did well. Beckler Gold did pretty good. Uh, Mormon Gold did fine. Uh, I think that uh, you're looking at uh, some areas in the market which are weak. Those areas are two cent pieces. Three cent pieces is silver and nickel are weak. Five, Liberty uh, V nickels have been weak. I saw some early Lincoln wheat cents that did extraordinarily well. Uh, some Morgan dollars did well. Uh, some peace dollars did well. So uh, we're seeing, uh, you know, the bottom of the uh, rare coin market, I think we hit probably about a year and a half ago in this current downturn. We're starting to see prices creep up. Uh, the major rarities are still hit and miss depending on what area of the market they're in. But, uh, you know, coins that are in the, uh, I would say, the 300 to two or $3,000 uh, dollar price range seem to be doing fine. And uh, when you start getting into some of these top pop high appeal coins in popular series like Indian, uh, Indian cents, uh, Lincoln cents, uh, early co uh, late date copper, uh, things that are still accessible to a uh, large uh, number of uh, collectors who are into classic coins. I think you, you're still seeing uh, strong coin uh, prices uh, for the market that we're in now. And uh, the ANA in Philadelphia was busy. And uh, the Heritage Auction, I'm going to look at that data this weekend. Uh, my gut tells me after looking at a few of the lots, uh, even though it wasn't one of their better sales as far as like major rarities, I think the prices there are probably going to be in line with what we saw at Goldberg's and uh, what we saw at Stacks uh, and Heritage's uh, A&A sales. 
Uh, another bit of news which I found quite interesting to report, and I'll show you this graph. Um, this is uh, from the United States Mint. Uh, we got notice uh, yesterday that the American Silver Eagle bullion coins, now these are the, uh, these are the coins, the non-mint marked uncirculated coins that are sold in monster boxes to authorize dealers, uh, has, uh, they, have, they have sold out of uh, their, their uh, in stock uh, quantity. Uh, they have uh, basically made purchasing uh, on suspension while they uh, come up with a method to produce more coins. As you see, uh, the 2018 issues uh, sold, uh, sold the most in January before falling off of the map, uh, selling under a million in February, March, and April, really slowing down in May and June, but picking up in the last three months. Uh, even if the trend line continues, and let's say the Mint is able to uh, get stock back soon, open up sales to authorized dealers, and even hit like a million coins a month, uh, for the remainder of the year uh, I don't know if uh, first of all I don't know if that's possible but secondly they're still going to fall well short of the uh, number of coins they sold last year and uh, the uh, amazing thing is it seems that the election of uh, Donald J Trump um, has really uh, put uh, the precious metals investing side of people's portfolio on hold while uh, the stock market and other uh, uh, places uh, to play in the market seem much more lucrative and uh, enticing. So uh, we saw uh, a huge drop off, like I said, last year, and the mints on pace to fall short by about 3 million coins. Uh, some analysts that I've seen, I've talked to in the market suggest that there's enough uh, legacy material, that's uh, coins that were produced uh, in prior years in the marketplace, and that this is uh, one of the reasons why people don't want to pay the premiums that you'd have to p uh, pay uh, over spot to buy 2018 American Silver Eagles. But of course, you know, this all changes uh, according to demand and uh, as you see, last few months, the demand's gone up, and my suspicion is that uh, the Mint estimated uh, that they would not have significant late-year demand, and therefore they were slowing down production as they uh, prepared for the 2019 issues. So that probably explains why uh, the Mint got caught uh, short, uh, not necessarily because uh, there's going to be this huge skyrocketing demand uh, beyond uh, what we're seeing right now. But uh, I could uh, totally miscalculate this, and we could be seeing the beginning of a major run on bullion um, if uh, bullion investors are losing confidence in uh, what they're seeing in Washington. And uh, given how crazy that's been um, on both sides of the aisle, it wouldn't be surprising to see uh, something, uh, something uh, develop there. All right, so uh, I wanted to share with you a few things before maybe I try to answer some questions for you. Um, I often talk to uh, uh, European collectors about uh, the benefit of getting graded, uh, coins graded and encapsulated. And one of the things I always tell them is like you have a uniform holder and uh, it preserves the coin and whether or not you agree with the grade, at least you can take your collection uh, and, and, and organize it in such a way that it is uniform. Uh, that works until you have uh, unusual sized coins. Um, so I want to show you a few of these, uh, a few of these holders uh, that I have uh, to give you some comparison in case you haven't seen them yourself because uh, I find them interesting. And I want to show you one PCGS holder I got recently that I thought was a complete and utter overkill. So uh, this is your run-of-the-mill um, PCGS holder. Um, this has got a Maldives uh, coin, uh, proof coin that I... Uh, I sent in for some reason. Anyway, so there's your run of the mill piece. But in this situation, I sent in a uh, 1976 50 rupees from India. And let's see if I can get this here. So this is kind of a you know a larger coin, but uh, at this point it looks very similar until you get to the side, and you'll see that 
the 50 rupees is thicker, uh, considerably thicker. And uh, this does not fit in any PCGS box that I have. And so uh, this part of my collection, these uh, 50 rupees coins, uh, are basically on the shelf of my bookshelf or in my safe deposit box uh, and, uh, and just sitting there. And it's, and it's kind of frustrating. So I hope at some point somebody at PCGS sees this video and realizes we need boxes if you're going to be doing stuff like this. Uh, this is a P4. Um, from NGC and again you see uh, normal uh, dimensions uh, on the face but the width is considerably thicker uh, to uh, take into account the thickness of the coin uh, again I would love to see boxes of this uh, this 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 is from the uh, World Fisheries Conference uh, this is a coin from Liberia probably not interesting to 99% of all collectors out there uh, but this is a Royal Mint issue, and, uh, and um, you know, it's uh, something I collect. Uh, and then I got these oblong coins from Tonga, uh, and uh, I sent them in for grading. I wasn't exactly sure how they would come, but it came back in one of these things. And I'll show you that dainty little oblong coin in the middle of all this plastic. And you see that, I mean, this is... This is a nice holder, I mean, but it's a complete and utter overkill. Um, but it's it's almost like a paperweight, and uh, and uh, you know I, I don't use it as such because I kind of want to, you know, want my coins lying around the house. But uh, yeah, I, I find this this is quite interesting. Um, that uh, uh, when I sent this in, I was not aware that I would have to. Uh, pay this uh, surcharge to get this giant holder, but you know, I get I guess it's worth it in the end um, It beats having it in a uh, loose site toilet seat, I guess so uh, There's there's that and uh, I also want to share with you guys uh, Some books that I've got uh, picked up recently uh, and that I can recommend uh, if you want to uh, uh, add to your library. Um, the first one is uh, this. This book comes with one of my my highest recommendation. Um, I think this is an essential book uh, if you collect world coins at all. This is Brian Stickney's A Monetary History of Central America. This was published by the American Numismatic Society. I picked this up at the uh, New York International uh, uh, New York uh, International Numismatic Convention and uh, this book basically is the red book for Central American coins. It has quite a bit of detailed information about each issue, uh, describes the coins in, in detail, close-up pictures. It's, uh, it's really a masterpiece and it won an NLG award uh, this year and deservedly so. In my opinion, this book could have been book of the year period. This is uh, the type, this is a t an area of the, of the, uh, of the coin, uh, world coin uh, collecting uh, area that is not well represented by English language books with a, a copious amount of detail. The best you can usually do is uh, the Krause catalog or uh, uh, if the coin's rare at all, maybe a, a, an auction listing. Uh, but uh, Stephanie did an amazing job in this book. I, can, I cannot recommend it enough. Uh, even if this book was over, I think this book's under $100, but if this book was $150 or $200, it'd still be worth it if you collect world coins. Uh, uh, my friend uh, David Fanning uh, sent me uh, this. This is uh, when he was uh, auctioning the John W. Adams uh, Library. Uh, and he sent me this great reprint of uh, John W. Adams, United States Numismatic Literature, Volume 1. Uh, what this book uh, does is it presents uh, a sort of an overview of uh, major 19th century uh, dealers uh, and figures uh, in the industry. Uh, it explains uh, a, a lot about Excuse me. It explains a lot about their uh, their business, uh, the time that they were in the industry, what their uh, auctions uh, consisted of, and uh, before John W. Adams uh, put this work together, there really was not uh, sort of a unified theory of uh, 
how the coin industry operated in the 19th century. We had we had pieces of data, but nothing that was curated and assembled. And uh, and John W. Adams uh, basically started uh, uh, started our understanding of uh, the the hobby and how it developed. Uh, these old catalogs aren't like the catalogs of today. They don't have um, photo color photos and 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 long descriptions and uh, and uh, provenances and uh, and all of the things that uh, we take for granted. Um, most of that work had to be done by going back to these old auction uh, auctioneers to see whose collection was being sold, what was in that collection, who bought it next, and then to trace the provenance back basically by doing uh, a word a word problem as opposed to seeing the coin, recognizing the die markers and, and cert numbers and all of this stuff. Uh, so I do want to thank uh, David uh, for sending me this book. Uh, Colby and Fanning has probably the most interesting catalogs of uh, any company in the numismatic industry. Of course, they're selling antiquarian books, but you learn so much about coins and the personalities behind the coin industry by reading their catalogs because when you're, when you're selling books, you're basically selling knowledge and um, part of that is the personality of the people who put the books together. So uh, anyway, John W. Adams, uh, a legend. I've met him a few times and uh, it's always a pleasure. He's, he's one of the great grand old gentlemen in the hobby. Uh, the ANS also sent uh, the AJN, the American Journal Numismatics, uh, volume 29 and 30 at the same time. Uh, I was wondering what happened to 29 last year. I don't think I, I did. I didn't think I got it, and uh, so I was kind of miffed about it. But apparently, they put they had enough material to put together two volumes, and they sent them out. And this just arrived in the mail uh, this month. Uh, again, uh, I recommend that collectors uh, have a diversified membership. Uh, I think membership in the ANA is is great. It's uh, not it's not expensive. Uh, a membership in the American Numismatic Society is uh, about four times as expensive as the ANA. However, I think there is value to doing that as well because for $100, uh, a, about $100 a year, you do get a book like this. You do get, uh, uh, I think, four issues of their uh, very um, graceful uh, and uh, erudite uh, magazine. Uh, and I think... Uh, the benefit of uh, expanding your knowledge base into areas of the hobby that you hadn't considered and seeing people write about coins from a sort of an academic uh, uh, perspective uh, will only benefit you as uh, you develop a more sophisticated palette for uh, the hobby. Um, it doesn't matter if you collect modern coins or ancient coins or, or uh, you know, dollars or anything. Uh, this material has a, a deep level of complexity that most people uh, only uh, scratch the surface of. Uh, and I can tell you right now, even, even going to like a mint, uh, the United States Mint or the Austrian Mint I went to a few years ago, just the complexity of how the designs are made and how the dyes are made and how uh, the machinery is operated and how the coins are inspected and how they're packaged and all of this stuff is so complicated that uh, getting something and looking at a COA that says 50,000 made and say, oh, I know everything about the coin. You don't. Yeah, you don't know anything about the coin at that point. So to me, when I saw uh, at the uh, the art uh, studios of these, these mints, like uh, just a wealth of literature and uh, artistic reference and things that these folks use in order to design what we consider just mundane uh, modern art uh, for these coins. It's, it's a very sophisticated process and it's uh, and it's worth uh, it's worth it to you. You'll enjoy the hobby a lot more if you start looking at uh, everything anew and figuring out like how to uh, really get into uh, the coin, whether it's a state court or, or something, you know, uh, something Augustus St. Gaudens did, there's craft to it and there's controversy to it and there's politics and there's 
propaganda. There's all sorts of levels to think about it. So uh, I do uh, I do think a membership in the ANS and and seeing what they they are about does have a benefit uh, for you if you want to you want to make a jump to becoming sort of an intermediate or advanced collector, especially if you want to start collecting areas that aren't typically covered in our mainstream coin media. Uh, my friend Jeff Stark from Coin World dragged this all the way to the ANA for me to buy for about 25 bucks. This is a, a Love It Scent, uh, a Confederate story. Um, the, these Confederate, uh, the Confederate coinage is a very controversial topic that uh, people um, only uh, talk about uh, in, in sort of general terms in most cases. Uh, this book uh, tries to uh, look at the uh, pattern coinage of the Confederacy and get to the bottom of, uh, you know, how it was made, who made it, and, uh, you know, what the uh, condition of the dies were in, um, where the coins went, uh, and uh, uh, how they were marketed in the 19th and uh, uh, century and uh, to the present. And... Uh, what the fakes are. So, uh, thank you, Jeff, uh, for um, you know saving me on shipping and dragging dragging this all the way to the ANA when you had a million things to do. And uh, Jeff Shevlin, a friend of mine, and Bill Hyder, a man with the most fantastic beard uh, and a and a great guy, uh, are finally going to wrap up their uh, follow up uh, so called dollar book. They're going to focus on the uh, so called dollars of the Panama Pacific. Exposition, which was held in 1915. If you're a classic commemorative coin collector, you know very well that the uh, Panama Pacific uh, half dollar, dollar, uh, uh, quarter eagle, and uh, $50 gold octagonal and round uh, slugs uh, were the official U.S. coins to come out of that program. But there are scores of medals that were struck, uh, so called dollars, uh, what they're called. And now, and uh, these were struck for that exposition. Uh, and uh, this is a uh, the first edition of their pocket price guide, which uh, you know, if you're a so-called dollar weenie, you can carry with you when you go to shows. It shows many uh, uh, metallic compositions of the these uh, pieces, which uh, some of which are very rare. Uh, and uh, this is a, a great uh, a great way to sort of have an up-to-date price of these uh, coins uh, based on uh, what uh, the market is and uh, within a few uh, I suppose within a few weeks maybe a month or so the uh, hardback and leather bound limited edition version of their uh, book about the uh, Panama Pacific so-called dollars will be out I definitely look forward to buying it I'm a, I'm a fanatic for these uh, 20th century uh, 19th and 20th century medals uh, private metals that were struck and I think so-called dollars are a great um, sort of a side hustle if you're into classic commemorative coins because the classic commemorative program as we knew it essentially originated from these metals. These metals are hugely popular and as soon as uh, promoters figured out a way to get Congress to make metals to go along with these uh, events uh, you saw a shift from, um, you know, 50, 60 medals made for an exposition to only a few, and then the, and then the, the official uh, half-dollar coin. So so-called dollars have always had a, a, a high, high regard, in my, my opinion. Uh, last book, uh, you, if you collect pandas, uh, this book is essential. It, I think it basically bypasses uh, or uh, anything that's uh, in the market, in the U.S. market, including, I'm sorry to say, Peter Anthony's work. Uh, this is the uh, gold and silver coins of China, the standard coinage of 1979 to 2017. I purchased this at Michael Chu's booth at the ANA. Uh, the author was there signing uh, uh, signing copies, and uh, if uh, his name is Jerry Lin. Uh, this book uh, was about $85. It is, uh, again, excuse me, well made, well put together, has uh, authorized mintages, number of pieces sold, beautiful photographs, uh, close up uh, representations of certain features of the coin. Uh, it's, this goes year to year, all denominations, all sizes. 
Uh, it's about the most comprehensive look at pandas that you'll find. Uh, and it's uh, bilingual in English and in Chinese. I don't know how you wouldn't have one of these. And if you're, uh, if you're a coin shop and you sell, uh, you get so uh, pandas that come in, you know, this is a critical reference. Again, I think it was like $85. You might be able to find it on eBay or from a book retailer for about that, or maybe less if you're lucky. Um, but uh, here you go. But, so those are my book recommendations uh, for uh, this episode. And, uh, you know, if um, you have some book recommendations or books you want me to read or pick up, uh, just send, uh, send me a, an email about it at news at coinweek.com and I'll check it out. All right, so uh, that's uh, pretty much my prepared remarks. It's uh, 1242. I'll give you guys about 15 or 20 minutes of questions if you got any, and I'm going to have to uh, scroll over here and see what you got. So um, let's see. I'll go back a few minutes. Uh, uh, so Keo1979-2001 asks me, uh, will you be at the Baltimore Coin Show? The answer to that question is yes. I will definitely be there. I'm bringing my camera, and I uh, plan to shoot a few segments uh, with some dealers and I'll shoot a cool coins and uh, hopefully get that up soon. Uh, I'm working on two things right now uh, for the channel. Uh, one is uh, the Queen podcast with uh, Ken Brissett who joined me today. We talked about the history of the Red Book, uh, his work at the Whitman Numismatic Journal 1960s, which is one of the best publications in the history of the hobby, I think. Uh, and uh, how the pricing system changed when we saw certified coins come into the floor uh, and uh, how coin collectors dealt with the super uncirculated coins before that. Of course, uh, MS 67s and 68s didn't just come out of nowhere. They've always been around. So what were people paying for these coins uh, decades ago before we you know, had 20 grades for the mint state spectrum. So we talked about these things quite in depth. I asked him about some of his most memorable moments in the hobby. This is a man who uh, literally went to uh, West Point Bullion Depository when the GSA was preparing to offer the uh, Carson City dollars to the general public. And uh, so he was at the forefront of that. He was in the assay commission. Uh, and did a number of things uh, that are just quite remarkable in the hobby. And you'll never guess that what he said was the most memorable thing in his entire career. Uh, but you will find out that answer on Monday when we publish the podcast. Um, it's going to be about 45 to 50 minutes long. So, um, but it's a, it's a great opportunity to learn a little bit about uh, the Red Book uh, and then the people behind it. Uh, and the second thing I'm working on, and I'm still not finished, but uh, Doug Winter and I filmed a segment on how to get into gold coins, classic U.S. gold coins. And then after that, David McCarthy from Kagan's and I did a video about some great ingots, uh, classic U.S. ingots. Uh, and uh, you'll find both of these uh, videos and the podcast uh, online probably by the end of next week. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, you can find uh, Larry Stendebach says, you can find plenty of peace dollars with luster, but finding fully struck up examples is very tough. So true, so true. In fact, actually, that's one of the big bugaboos about the 21, the, uh, the high relief. Uh, finding them with uh, a good, like full strike of hair is like super, super difficult. Uh, but I would say the one thing about uh, peace dollars or any coin is you have to know what they typically come and uh, when you buy a superior example that is an example that comes better than they typically come. You don't want to like not get that coin because it's not perfectly struck. It may be that that's as good as they come. Uh, but yeah, they, they uh, the, you know, the walking livery half dollar never comes fully struck, especially in the center axis. And uh, that's one of the reasons I never like that coin, even though like I like the design, the idea of it. And I love the reverse of it. I just every time I look at the hands and the, and the knee, I'm like, is that worn? It just never, it never feels right uh, to me. Um, let's see. Uh, 
how to, uh, toning on peace dollars would make them more expensive. So true, but you know, not all toning's good. You saw that, you saw that 21 and 67 I showed you. That thing has toning, but is it good toning? I didn't think so. Um, let's see, uh, let's see. We're gonna salivate metal and all those guys. I don't know, let them know that they missed it. I'll be back in a couple weeks. We can watch, uh, we can do it again. And I'd love to take their uh, questions and comments uh, live on the air while we, uh, while we do this. Uh, I have no monopoly on all the great information that you're gonna find. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, let's see, another question here. Um, uh, what do you usually cover in your chat? I've been doing this for a little 10 months. I've learned a lot and I have beautiful coins. So I'm glad, new coin, that you have a lot of beautiful coins. Um, coin collecting is not a race. It's like a lifetime uh, a devotion to, uh, to uh, understanding uh, money. Um, coins are psychedelic objects. You know, there's a lot that goes into them, I think. Um, and uh, uh, one of the reasons I got attracted and uh, fascinated about coins is because it seemed like a coin rooted you in a time and a place. You know, when I got uh, a quarter and changed and it said 1965, it made me think, well, what was happening in 1965? What what would it have felt like to uh, get this coin when it was brand new? Um, I was going through a box of, uh, I have a, a box of uh, clad quarters I collected about 10 or 15 years ago. And uh, they were, you know, 66s and 67s. And I went through all the coins of my childhood years uh, from the, you know, the 70s and the, and the early 80s. Um, and, and I, and I looked at these coins and I wanted to buy coins that look like the coins that I got in change when they were, when they were brand new, you know, like in, it's like the middle of January and, and you're, and you're, you just get the new coins from the bank. And so to me, it was like it, the journey wasn't, what is the coin worth? Is it going to be rare? What is the pop? It was like, can I find coins that look like they looked in my memory? And, uh, you know, the, what I found was that you can't. You literally can't. With clad coins, they all tarnish. They all they lose that like whiteness they have. Almost all of them have some degree of toning, and it's even worse for nickels. Nickels tone like like almost like after a year or two, they're not the same color anymore. And so to me, it was like sort of like the disappointing thing was the final realization that there are no coins that look exactly like they looked from my memory because every coin ages. But uh, having, you know, an MS67 or 66, 1983 P quarter, was, it's just, to me, it's like magical. It ties me to my childhood and it's not a mint, state, a mint set coin. So you really have to find somebody who hoarded them and had, you know, had good coins in those roles. Um, let's see here. Uh, 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 thank you, uh, Numis Man, Black Steel and Silver, uh, Numis Man, for uh, your comment. Appreciate it. Um, uh, good book on the so-called dollars. Uh, well, Mega Red has uh, something. Jeff Shevlin put uh, some information in. There's the uh, the standard reference on so-called dollars has uh, been around. Um, I would just uh, go to Wizard and just type so-called dollars. I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, off the top of my head what the title of that book is but um, you can also uh, I have a, a spotlight of so-called dollars a three-part article on coin week you, you can read uh, we talk about quite a bit of uh, how that um, so-called dollars are, are organized um, let's see uh, keep going here uh, what's your favorite coin to collect in low grades um, I have to go way back, you know, when I was a when I was a kid, I used to go to junk boxes and Indian cents were like the thing for me. I loved Indian cents. Um, broke my heart when I realized that the uh, the uh, nickel ones uh, from around the Civil War would would never be in a junk box because they were too valuable. So I would I would just get all the Indian cents I could get. I loved the sort of the the wood grain ones that sort of don't have the, uh, you know, they don't look like Lincoln cents. They actually look like, uh, they look antique, you know, when a, when a wheat cent would look worn out. 
the Indian scent would look flatter and more antique. So yeah, to me, in low grades, it was things like Indian scents, large scents, early coppers. Uh, you know, I, I never had a 18th century uh, copper coin that wasn't in like good or very good uh, conditions. So to me, like in, in coins like that, the appeal was that these are literally relics. And uh, when I see Mint State examples of them, uh, there's almost an element of unrealness. Um, I've handled Mint State 18th century coins, um, you know, multi-million dollar coins uh, when I've been to major auctions and they're works of art, but as something relatable to like an average person, they're, they're, they're beyond uh, what I could comprehend on that, at that level. So to me, if you have like a 1798 cent, that's in very good or fine. I mean, that to me is like an everyman coin. Uh, whereas a mint state 63 or something like that is just, it's almost like it should be in a museum. It shouldn't be, I shouldn't be holding it, you know? Let's see here. Uh, um, uh, coal box a piece and Morgan's for 15 bucks a coin. Should I get those for the silver content or stick to bullion? Well, you're paying a premium, I think, if they're 15 bucks a coin and they're calls, they're also 90%, right? So my advice is if you're going for spot buys, and this is uh, to Richard in Tucson, I think get as close to spot as you can and get like as pure as you can and just like forget the history. You know, if you're going for, if you're going for metal by metal. Uh, a lot of mistakes people make is that they, uh, they, try to do, they try to do both things. They try to get metal, but then they try to get numismatic value. And honestly, you know, if you're investing, you're investing. It's not really meant to be fun. It's meant to be getting, buying right and selling right. Okay. So um, I think in that circumstance, you want to, you want to get, you want to get bullion coins and uh, the junk silver and all that stuff. I mean, there's a, there, it, it's, it's, it, to me, it, it, that stuff is more discounted when you go sell it than if you're buying like, you know, silver eagles, pandas, maple leaves, um, you know, crew grands and all that kind of stuff. I think you're, you're much better off with like bullion coins over, over that kind of stuff. Um, plus, you know, depending on how worn it is, right. Uh, it's lost. Uh, it's, it's been this, the term for it is sweating. It's a, uh, it's, it's a loss, some of that content. So it's going to be underweight from what you think it is, you know, maybe not by much or anything, but, but it is, you're losing out. Um, Colorado coin hunter, you love my videos. I appreciate that. I love that you love my videos. They're sometimes way harder to make than that than they look, um, and I appreciate that. Uh, do you think Barber have some very good or better or good sleepers to be picking up? I've been collecting for about fifteen years. I haven't seen much of a swing. You know, the Barber series is kind of like one of those. Um, it's one of those series that doesn't have a huge passionate collector base. I'm sorry to say, they're cool, and uh, every U.S. coin I think is historic. But, uh, but for some reason, that series is just never really caught on. Um, one of the reasons, I think, is that there's this prejudice against Barber. Um, he, he was, I think, it, I think he was a, a, a much better engraver he's given credit for. I think he was a, a professional. Uh, he's uh, often uh, remembered as somebody who was cantankerous or didn't get along with George Morgan. And... Uh, you know, some people think he might have ruined the Caballito Peso in Mexico and uh, by working on it and, and uh, was uh, down on the St. Gaudens designs. And I think none of this is fair. Um, he, he, he was basically uh, the chief engraver of the Mint trying to make the nation's coins, which is what his job was. And uh, he was being put upon, if you will, in the case of St. Gaudens uh, with uh, Teddy Roosevelt's uh, meddling pet crime. Uh, and St. Saint, Saint Gaudens was ill also at the time. He's near the end of his life when he was coming up with these coin designs. And so a lot of the work wasn't finished or could be, couldn't be finished because, uh, because Augustus wasn't feeling really well. Plus a lot of the uh, back and forth, uh, you know, was not, you know, in person. It was through the mail and, and things like that. And I, I just think he gets a bad rap. I think when you look at the... Uh, Barber dimes and quarters and half dollars. So one of the knocks against it, and it's the same knock you get with the uh, seated liberty. Is just 
it's the same design repeated over three denominations and that's not very original he also uh, suffers a little bit from the fact that after the barber half dollar came the walking liberty half right after the barber dime came the mercury dime which is just the best dime design in the history of the country and then after the uh, barber quarter was the standing liberty quarter which you know had its own problems but I think people look at it and, and revere it more than they do the barber design. So um, I don't think, uh, I think in the case of sleepers, I don't think any circulated U.S. coin is a sleeper because there's more than enough uncirculated examples that exist to satisfy whatever the demand's going to be. And uh, I think people want to see the design. And I will say the exception is if you're collecting early coppers uh, by variety or um, by, you know, and, 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 and dates that are very difficult for most people to afford, I think in those situations, you know, circulated uh, coins are fine. Bust halves are another example. So there are certain types of coins where even if they're circulated, there's still a market for, but I don't think modern coins work that way. And I would consider the barber coinage to be fairly modern. Uh, do you think do chop marks uh, on trade dollars uh, do anything to the value of the coin uh, from Dave Dalman upside and downside? Well, here's the thing: the upside is a chop mark on a coin is art, right? Stamped on the coin, like the calligraphy, the Chinese calligraphy can be artistic. It also can be very historic. It can mean something. Um, and so uh, there used to be a prejudice against trade dollars with chop marks on it. They were considered damaged. It's post-mint damage. Technically, that's true. But what you're seeing in that situation is these are regulated, regulated by foreign merchants, just like the brazier doubloon uh, or, or the brazier regulated coinage. You would put EB, stamp EB on some uh, South American coins. Uh, these, that's graffiti or whatever you want to call it, except it's regulating the coin so that it could be used or or um, it could be understood by people who are tra trading in it to have been accurately vetted um, and uh, so chop marks and coins I don't consider graffiti I consider those are regulation marks uh, and some of these marks are quite collectible and in recent years there's been a, a major uh, interest in them and uh, you know I think honestly it's a it's a great place to, to, to collect you can get uh, trade dollars from a variety of dates with a variety of chop marks. There's a, a lot of study that's been going into it to figure out which dates and which chop marks are scarce and, and, and all that. So I think it's just a added dimension of complexity and I would not be surprised uh, to see uh, to see that uh, continue to increase in popular, uh, popularity. Uh, why didn't you go to Long Beach show and you can say assayer again? I'm such a child, yeah. Yeah, well, I say things the way I say it. I guess it's a part of the problem from being from the Mid-Atlantic. Um, I didn't go to Long Beach show. I, I was tied up with a few things, but uh, uh, we, uh, you know, I, I don't usually do that show. I went in February. I wanted to, uh, I had a few meetings scheduled, uh, and I also wanted to see the first of the Tyrant Collection displays, which are marvelous. But uh, being, uh, being on the East Coast, I don't get to California very often uh, anymore. Um, let's see, uh, U.S. half cents. Yep, great. Um, one of my first half cent, 1804 cross lit four. Um, I just uh, couldn't believe I had a coin that old, and I think that coin was probably an AU at the time, so uh, I was doubly excited to have it. Uh, let's see, Scott, how low are premiums right now compared to recent history, uh, given the low spot price and lower rates specifically? Again, I mean, any premium you're paying for something that's metal is, uh, you got to take into account like what the metal content is and whether or not you could do better buying modern. I don't. I think buying vintage metal is it's metal. So it doesn't matter if it's new or old. If you're only buying it because it's metal, then the question is, do you want good metal or do you want mediocre metal? Um, there's a reason why no major bullion coin producing country is making uh, 0 0.900 gold. Uh, now, um, well, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I think most of them are making 999 or four, four nines or, or whatever. So to me, I think you're better off just sticking with bullion or rounds. 
uh, pamp bars, Kitco bars, whatever the thing is, whatever you can get at the least amount of premium possible because the problem is uh, precious metals would have to go up the premium in order for you to break even. And, uh, you know, you have to take that into account. So I think uh, one of the things you're seeing, when one of the reasons demand has been down for some of these bullion coins is that there's just so much bullion out there uh, that you don't have to pay the new premium. You can just get a 2015, looks the same, same metal weight and everything, and you're not paying, you're not paying the mint the, their, their premium. All right, guys, it's 1 o'clock in the morning. Um, the midnight hour is over. Um, if you enjoyed this, uh, please uh, drop me a line and email. Uh, I appreciate all your comments. Uh, again, I think we're going to do this as a bi-weekly thing uh, unless I'm out of town or I don't really have anything newsworthy to discuss. Um, this is my first effort to use this overlay program. Uh, it was fairly easy to use and I think I probably could do better on the graphics. Uh, I do most of the graphics for Coin Week. Uh, my partner Scott does uh, handles a lot of the graphics as well. I do most of the graphics on the video, so uh, we can I can kind of dress it up so it's not a white screen and some coins. Uh, but I do appreciate you guys uh, spending the time with me. Uh, we're trying to run counter programming to those late night coin shows that get you to pay way too much money for something. So <laughs> if you uh, if you enjoy that 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 uh, that sort of act of subterfuge, I appreciate that uh, being good humored about it and. Uh, and uh, we uh, will be back Monday with uh, more content for you. And until uh, then, I'm Queen with Editor Charles Morgan signing off, man. Happy collecting.